This is episode number 63 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome back to the show. If you're new here, my name is Dylan Perrin and I am the host of the Animals at Home podcast. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting high-level creative care individualized for each animal. If you are familiar with the way Animals at Home Network functions, you know that Bryce and I, Bryce is the host of the Animals Everywhere podcast, we typically alternate. He does an episode one week and then I do one the next week. I am stealing Bryce's slot this week. So I had one last week and I'm now posting one this week. And that's because Bryce is in the middle of a massive move. He's moving all of his things from his home as well as his reptile room and his studio and everything to a new place in South Africa. And if you follow him on YouTube, you'll see him doing that. And I know he is in the middle of doing a bunch of things. So he's very, very busy. So I thought I would just do two in a row and then we'll get back to the regular pattern next week. As always, if you're looking for more information on this episode as well as any other episodes or Bryce's show, head to animalsathomenetwork.com and all the show notes and information is there. And you also have the opportunity to donate if you'd like to either show. Just click on the header for either show. You will see a donate button, a PayPal button at the bottom of each footer. And as I said last week, I am in the middle of designing new Animals at Home podcast shirts. I'm currently being sent a sample package of a few different items. So as soon as I get them, which should be in the next couple weeks, things do tend to get hung up at the border right now with COVID and everything but as soon as I get them if they do look good and they approve my or get my stamp of approval they will be on the website for you to purchase and of course five dollars with every t-shirt does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy which is a charity that Animals at Home is a proud supporter of so if you are interested in a t-shirt make sure you keep an eye on my Instagram page at Animals at Home CA and I will make the announcement there when they are officially ready to order as you guys know my show is really dedicated towards advancing the reptile hobby towards better care and that's why the show sponsor Custom Reptile Habitat Habitats.com does sell a lot of the items that allow you to do that. So make sure you go check them out. They are in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. Those are affiliate links. So if you do purchase something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. Of course, don't just go purchase something to support me. Go look at their website. If you do need something over the next few months, you can know that a small commission will come back to the show and you're supporting the podcast and supporting your animal's health by advancing its care. All right, let's jump into today's episode. Today is a very special episode. I'm excited to share this one with you. There is a ton of information here, and it's probably one that you're going to want to listen to more than once. Today, I'm speaking with Roman Murren, who is really one of a kind in the hobby. He has this incredible engineering background where he was working on helicopters and their sensory input systems and understanding how to take sense data from around a helicopter and put it into a system to allow the pilots to help control the the aircraft, which Obviously, that is an incredibly simplified version of what he was doing, but all of that knowledge has allowed him to come into the hobby and really be one of the primary sources for understanding, particularly heat. Of course, heating and lighting go together, but Roman is a a wealth of information when it comes to understanding how to implement and supply infrared systems in our enclosures to allow our animals to thrive. So of course it goes without saying that this episode revolves around understanding heat, especially infrared A and understanding the difference between infrared A and infrared C, especially when that comes to how it interacts with a reptile's body. We discuss how to properly set up thermostat probes. Roman takes us through a very interesting study that he's currently doing while he's testing different types of visible light in an eight foot vivarium. I don't want to get too into this too much because the conversation really goes into this and we don't. I don't need to cover it in the intro at all, but I do want to say two really quick things before we start. The first is this episode will really assume that you've already listened to episode number 29 with Sam Parrott, that's Replicating the Sun, and episode 55 with Joseph Braben, that is Following Nature's Example. Both of those episodes really give a good foundation of understanding heat and light, and I think Roman is really the primary source for both of those episodes because both Sam and Joseph are always consulting with Roman to understand heat further. So I would say if you haven't listened to those, go back to those episodes and listen to them first and then come back to this episode. And the second thing is Roman was kind enough to show some uh, fantastic graphs on the screen from a presentation or a PowerPoint presentation he has. So if you are listening to just the audio version, maybe you're driving in your car, no worries. You can probably listen to about 85 to 90% of this podcast without any issues, but I highly recommend going back later and going to the YouTube version so you can see those graphs. You can actually see what we're talking about. Other than that, let's just jump into this fantastic episode and I will talk to you after it's done. Enjoy. So Roman, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. I think it is very much worth pointing out that we've, I've talked about heating tons on the show. We've had some great guests, Sam Parrott and Joseph Rabin from JTB Reptiles, and I've talked about it on the YouTube channel as well. But you are basically the primary source for all of the information for us. I think everybody goes to you for the information. And so I'm super excited to get into this topic because I think you can get us even further than we have before. So before we do that, can you 
give us a little outline of your background because you kind of have a non-reptile related career and education and then you somehow got into the reptile hobby. So maybe you could kind of answer those two, your, your education uh, career and then how you got into the hobby. Always been an engineer. Um, I started off with working in a company that makes refrigerators for beers. So it was temperature and control for um, beer coolers, actually. <laughs> and then I be, you know, went to become a proper engineer. So I spent five years going to college um, to get my qualifications. And I worked to work, went to work for a, a company called Western Helicopters in the Southwest. Um, but during college, I took a year out or took a long time out and went to, to play in New Hampshire in the, in the White Mountains there. And I caught my first turtle in 1974 little male painted turtle and I thought it was just the sweetest thing good looking lovely thing Um, kept them ever since went to work for helicopters Um, hobby took a backseat position for a a few years while career and kids came along and then I got posted to Italy um, for a couple of years doing qualification work on the H101. Um, but at work, I was head of flight control systems. So, you know, flight control systems and helicopters. Um, and what, what the job was, was taking data from different signal sources and converting them into control of the helicopter, actuators, motors, moving, moving things. And so my interest in how things work and how you control them stems from that background controlling an aircraft um two years in italy and where i joined the natural history societies there and some of the wetland stuff um and then we won the contract to do apache uh build an apache in, in in britain so i went back to england and helped write the spec and in the process of writing the spec i got a lot of sensors on the apache um optical and visual and radar and they all get combined they um the visual and the infrared get get merged as a sensory output to the pilot and so when you combine sensors the output you get is more than the sum of the two bits of information so it's really very valuable and then you can plot that plot that with other information and so in terms of data fusion that's another learning curve because i've got involved with um, designing helmet mounted displays and the use of lasers and visual effects so I got to know about wavelengths and stuff like that Um, and then stuff happened and the world took over and they ended up living in America two or three times (laughs) with different jobs so I ended up commuting to New York on the um, the American helicopter program the the presidential aircraft of the H-71 which you guys have now bought because the, the Americans decided we delivered nine aircraft and they decided they didn't like them. Because so they Canada bought them. <laughs> so, um, but you're flying the cormorants, the search and rescue cormorants. Right, right, that's right. Which is, which is our aircraft. Oh, and the cool. flight control system in there is what, what I designed. And so the aircraft we built for the president were cancelled because they weren't American. And you guys said, here, yes, please, we'll have those. We'll take them. You, you, you bought them at a snip. Um, and funnily enough, the guy I worked with was um, had become an MP in um, for Toronto, Joe Daniel. Wow. And I've been over and went to the Aziz of Parliament with him. Anyway, you've got our helicopters. And with that, it was more sensor work, more control work, understanding how stuff works, all physics. And, and that's how I got into doing the background of my knowledge. And at the same time, when I lived in... Phoenix on the Apache. I joined the Phoenix Herp Society and Phoenix Zoo and the Tortoise Club, and I got a license to keep turtles. And then when I lived in Indiana, I joined the Indiana Natural History Society and did birding and reptile. So I know herpetology in America really quite well. You know, I've caught painted turtles and turtles in Arizona, in Florida, in Michigan, in New Hampshire, in in Maine. You know. All over I've been, and, and so I know I know your herpetology quite well. Um, and so when I retired, or when the contract got cancelled by at the end of beginning of this 
century, um, I said, I'll go. <laughs> and then I could spend time on doing this. And about that time, I um, there were red-eared turtles everywhere, just just everywhere. Um, been released into our ponds. The Ninja Turtle stuff happened. Um, so I, I said, well, I'll, I'll build a pond. Um, I'll build it, and I'll put them in it. And they started dying, and I didn't know why. And, you know, being the inquisitive sort, I, I had all sorts of theories, and people talked about what it was. But actually, there was um, proper science behind it that nobody had written about hibernation of turtles um, in the hobby. But there were a couple of people like Jackson, Donald Jackson, who's a real hero of mine. And he put a few papers together along with Schultz and and all those other heroes, um, Lovich was another one, and they they've done studies on how they can turtles can take in oxygen and how to use oxygen, how they hibernate. And I read all these bits of paper and I started putting them together, and it started making a story. So I I wrote this piece, and I think I sent it to you the um, yeah. the stuff on hibernation. Yes, yeah, you did. And and that was started when they were still working, and then just as I got to the end, Jackson retired. And he wrote a fabulous, fabulous book. And if you haven't read it and you're into turtles, it's Donald Jackson, Life in a Shell, one of the seminal books about hibernation of turtles, but also applies to all sorts of reptiles. So that then opened doors, and I started understanding why my animals were dying. And so so I started telling people, look, you need to think about oxygen and stuff like that. Um, and so I was doing all right then, but some of my turtles, after hibernation, had problems with their eyes, all the fleshy bits, um, if the water hadn't been perfect, were, would start puffing up and being unhealthy. So you and think that was like infection type thing? Is that kind of what you were seeing it as? Yeah, it was, it was a bacterial or a viral infection, and I couldn't explain it. And the vet... But the vets don't bugger all. Excuse me. <laughs> if you're a vet, you're listening. <laughs> if you're listening here, you do know, but most vets don't know. Um, yeah. And it was, it was um, give them this antibiotic. And sometimes it worked and sometimes they didn't. A fungal treatment. Give them this, you know. And I thought they've got, they've got to be reason. And by that time, I'd built a little dome. It's like a geodesic dome. Uh, it's uh, four meters across and it's about four meters tall. And I, by then I was starting to be quite serious about spotted turtles. So I put my spot um, they were in there. But these turtles that had poorly eyes, I put them in a the dome in sunlight. And all of a sudden, they started healing. And I couldn't work out why. And it's about that time I met this fabulous person, Francis Baines. And um, she and I, well, this was 2003, and she, she's just getting into this um, UVB thing. And she, she'd been a vet, um, but she'd got this poorly uh, dragon, bearded dragon, and she wanted to know why it wasn't behaving well and its back legs were So she she started investigating and she discovered um, about UVB. And she discovered it from Gary Ferguson, who'd done some work um, on UVB and, ex and ex explained how the UVB thing works. But he was a scientist and he knew about the physics of reptiles. But Fran was a vet and she knew about the, the, the makeup, the physiology of reptiles. And between them, they, they've got this fabulous story together um, and put biggest single impact on keeping of herbs ever, I think, because their science has, has changed how we keep reptiles. Um, anyway, I'm, I've become friends with this mad woman. Lovely she is. She's... <laughs> she's, she's, <laughs> you, you don't ask her questions and you, you you ask her questions and she says oh yeah yeah i think i remember that and she'll find some reference to it yeah. or you pose yeah. a question and she'll go away and she you, you speak to her next and she'll give you the whole spiel about 
how that works. She's a really bright, bright person. Well, even on Facebook, you'll see she'll come comment and she'll answer a question. It'd be like three or four paragraphs long oh, explaining yeah, she's everything. A, <laughs> she's, I think she's the smartest cookie in herpetology that there is at the moment. She's just yeah. a real nice person. Anyway, she's she's become a friend and we, we, we go and do talks together. She talks about UV and I talk about heat and we kind of mix and match. But of course, she's a lot smarter than I am. But... <laughs> But we do some, somehow mix each other's business because it's light. Mm -hmm. And she'll put me right more often than, than not. And she, I know, but, but then again, I don't always agree with what she says. And I said, look, Fran, that's not quite how. And it, it's usually electronics or control the technology that I, because of my background, you see. Right. So I know all that stuff. And I'm not, I'm not a physicist, but I'm not scared of it because right. of my job. You know, I sort of had a flight control systems. I had people that were way, way smarter than me and knew physics and stuff, but they could. They were missing out on all the sorts of other factors. And when you tie in all the bits of knowledge, you get a different answer. And um, that's what Fran and I do. We, you know, we pull bits of information together to to make to provide information to you guys that is much more than just a single bit of information either one of us can give. It's and a perfect it's, synergy between those two. Oh yeah, it's, it's a lovely and thing. And, and yeah. more recently, I've been doing stuff with Gary, um, who's, who's retired now. And we met, he, he was also talking at the Chiracqua Museum, um, which, by the way, if you're American, it's in the southwest on the border between Arizona and New Mexico. You've got to go there. It's just an absolutely brilliant, brilliant place. Oh, and while I'm at it, my mate who lives down the road, Tell Hicks, you, you've heard of Tell Hicks? Yeah, yeah, I have. He's, he's quite a good artist. <laughs> he fell over and broke his neck, but, uh, yeah, literally. So he's, you know, he was paralyzed, thingy, and can't paint as well as he used to be able to. Oh, my God. But the point was, when I was living in Arizona, Hicks and his mates in the Desert Museum, and they've got a whole collection of um, rattlesnakes and desert animals in there um just a fantastic collection of um, rattlesnakes well anyway tell uh, was working on rattlesnakes and the artwork for his rattlesnake book in fact that's the book rattlesnakes of arizona yeah this Very is nice. the book on rattlesnakes but the point is all the artwork is by Tell. He is a fantastic artist. Oh, he's brilliant. Anyway, he's just down the road from us. And so I don't know how we got to that. What were we, what were, what were we talking about? Oh, you were talking about the, the museum in, uh, in New Mexico. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. If, you, if yeah. you're Southwest, go and see it. It's got all of his paintings, his original paintings, um, hanging around, fantastic collection of artwork. And um, Arizona is my favorite place and i've seen i don't know 40 or 50 no, 42 states in america and it's my favorite state it really really is a knockout state and the southwest um patchy junction go see it if you're a herpetologist what we were talking about we were so, so, oh yes we did the, we do talks together fran and i yes exactly that's yeah. where i met gary ferguson mm -hmm. um and i've been doing this this work recently and um, some of Gary's earlier work was very similar to what I'm doing. But of course, it was 30 years ago um, and technology and stuff has changed. But his principal ideas were really, really good. And so I didn't I wanted to build on what he'd done and, and pick his brains because his brains are much, much sharper than mine and he knows stuff I don't. So and he's been helping me a little bit in doing that work and I'm really keeps asking me awkward questions and I don't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it goes, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, it's, is that enough about about me? That's too much already, isn't it? No, no, that's fantastic. I, I kinda wanna jump back to the when you first put the, the spotted turtles into the dome, because I'm curious if, if you were keeping them outside in the pond, what was making the you so, so you, were they healing in the dome? What, what do you think was healing? Was it the UV or ah. because they should have got access to UV outside? Okay, the pond. so so we, we know that UV 
gives you vitamin D3. Oh, you know, all the stuff that France will tell you that happens between it being illuminated by D3 and then all of a sudden it's all over the body and it's doing all sorts of things, really useful things. And not just calcium buildup, but it's enables the sex drive in it, just everything. It's really important. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute. So, um, what I'd realised by doing some some work with keratin, and I, what triggered me was I saw an article about why polar bears keep warm. Now, everybody says polar bears keep warm because of um, the insulation of air. Yeah, it's the layer of air between the outside and inside. What somebody had done had looked at keratin and the... Um, transmission properties of keratin as a material you know like like a bit of plastic or something and they realized that keratin blocks um one form of infrared which is infrared c so it passes light through keratin is translucent to light and it's translucent to infrared a infrared a penetrates um deeply into the skin more deeply than any other wavelength and that's about 800 nanometers. So that can go right through into the skin and warm the inside of the body. Keratin is translucent to that. So infrared A goes straight through it. But infrared C doesn't. It's blocked just like it is in glass. So once the heat comes through the sun, through the skin and into the body, it warms the body up. But because it's changed energy levels, it now can't get out. A bit like a greenhouse. You know, just like a greenhouse, the sun comes through, gives off energy onto the rocks. Those rocks warm up, but they re-radiate a different wavelength. And that wavelength is blocked by the glass. Same thing for keratin. So I sent off some samples to Manchester University. I've got a contact there. And he, he sent me the, um, the transmission graphs. And that's, they, it was just like glass. Ah, oh, fantastic. So now I understood that that infrared was important. And then I started looking at what infrared A did physiologically. And I found that there was just a shed load of really poor papers. I mean, people selling infrared heaters and justifying why they work. But amongst the 30 or 40 papers, there's three or four really good ones that explained that infrared A is actually good physiologically. And after the war, they found that um, wounds or, or, or gashes in the were healed healed much more quickly, and they, two or three times more quickly if they were subjected to sometimes infrared radiation. You know that warm feeling. Yeah. That you get. Well, that's healing you, and and they found that that infrared was actually quite beneficial to to the health. So I thought, well, I concluded that part of the healing was the fact that they were getting infrared. And it was that infrared that was helping them heal. Now, when you tie that together, that both in infrared and UVB are bactericides, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now you're killing the bacteria and the viruses, as well as providing the healing benefits of infrared A. And I think that's what, that was the answer. Um, Animals now outside never have seen any of that problem. And and by the way, we we talking about COVID at the moment, aren't we? Yeah. And we we worry, and that's a respiratory infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Makes us cough and whatever, whatever, and yeah. all our bronchial tubes are screwed up by this reinfection and the, and the, the storm that follows. Scarily enough, there's a fellow called John Campbell. Make a note of this, MD. Go and look for Dr. John Campbell and vitamin D3. I think I've seen that video. I'll make sure I add it to the show notes so people can yeah, see it. Yeah, because, because this is the, is nature cunning or what? The um, vitamin D3, which comes from UV, is uh, one of those tools that the body uses to stabilize any such um, reactions 
And so when you've got this, this stuff happening in your lungs, the vitamin D3 part of it helps fight that reaction. It helps the immune system. So if you've got good vitamin D3 levels, your ability to cope with COVID D3 improves, I don't know, whatever John Campbell says, but it's significant. Yeah. Now, imagine if you've got animals that have got respiratory infections and they've got a shortage of vitamin D3. They also haven't got the tools to deal with it. Yeah. It's a byproduct of the UVB stuff that Fran is saying. Yeah. Because it's it's not just doing the calcium work, it's doing the sort of um, beneficial dealing with infections and stuff. And we have so, so many respiratory infections in the hobby. You always see it. People have RIs all the time. Yeah, and most yeah. of the time, they're not coupled with a UV source. And we wonder why. And it's like, that's probably yeah, one of the main UV reasons. and infrared helps as well. Mm -hmm, right. Put the light sources together and better still put them in the sun. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to beat the sun. What's the next thing? So I did have a question about the uh, the uh, the infrared C. So because at one point in my life I was selling cell phones, and I remember when we move at this time we were moving from the three G network to the LTE network, and the LTE network was a slight was faster frequency, and so it was a faster connection, but it didn't have the ability to penetrate as deep into through concrete. So when you would go into the basements and whatnot, you drop back to the three G. So intuitively i was kind of thinking that maybe irc or infrared c would still pass through bodies but maybe it was just too weak to actually warm the inside but maybe now that i'm hearing what you're saying it's actually the properties of keratin that just stop the infrared c from getting into the body is that right correct okay yeah so so um are you familiar with cutoff filters no okay I won't go down that path then. Um, <laughs> basically, it's, um, I'll tell you what, I might have a graph on this. Can I do that? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. So if you see the two, the curve that goes up, then up to 90%, and then down at 2,700 nanometers. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so that's glass. So glass is, and you're familiar with visible light. So yep. glass at about, I don't know, 300 nanometers, transmits 92% of all its light. And it carries on transmitting 92% of all of its light until it gets to about 2,000 nanometers. Yeah? Gotcha. Yep. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, see, and it drops off. And it at 2,800 or something, it's only 30% or 25% of all the light actually gets through glass. Right. And then at 3,700, no light gets through glass. So infrared C is much longer wavelength than that. It goes up to 5,000, 10,000 nanometers. So it's completely blocked by the glass. And so the next slide, I've got that glass again here. You, can you see my mouth moving? Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. So you see this is the transmission for the glass that you've yep. just seen. Yeah? Yep, yeah. The dotted line. Now this is with, this is um, this purple one is 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can see that it just won't get transmitted by the glass. And at 90 degrees centigrade, nothing gets goes through the glass. Well, keratin is the same. Right. Keratin right. has the same properties. Where is that graph? There. Now, these are the curves I got from Manchester Universities for keratin. And you can see that this isn't transmission. This is opacity, attenuation. So you can see that around here, these wavelengths get totally passed by keratin. And these are Chokwala, the eyed lizard. Um, there's the snake was a adder. And there's a turtle, which was a um, slider. And you can see that down here, the keratin is actually transmitting all of those wavelengths. Right. Okay. Stop share. Here we go. That worked. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, that's great. So, so okay, so, so that makes sense. So it is. It has to do with the properties of the keratin because 
so intuitively, I would think a longer wavelength can pass through things easier. Like even when you get into like radio waves, right? Like AM, the longer the wave oh, yeah, travels it, further. Oh yeah, it'll travel further. It just can't get through the keratin. Well, it, because it's a block. Right. Exactly. Interesting. And and that was one of the things that well, I had made the video that about adding uh, you know halogen to my carpet python a lot of and I probably used slightly hyperbolic language but I, I I said this could this is really the first time this animal may have felt warm in his whole life and yeah. some people said hey that's that's not really fair to say that but the reason I said it that way is because as warm blooded creatures we don't understand what it must be like for a cold blooded animal to rely on the environment to have that energy source and to be cold blooded i can't imagine what it would be like to only have infrared c in your environment uh that's exactly right because you'll only get the surface warm now right um and it is infrared a that matters because a bit of stone will also get heated up with visible light. You know, if you get a magnifying glass and you burn that little black spot on yeah. paper, well, that is all visual light burning that spot. And all you've done is you've focused light from that size onto a tiny spot. And so you've got a few watts on that area per centimeter. But yeah. if you look at that spot, it's hundreds of watts per centimeter there. And so if you've got a, a white light, like an LED spotlight, even though it's only 20 or 30 watts, if you're focusing it down onto a basking spot, that spot will get warm. And so the animal will get warm superficially, but that won't be penetrating deep into its body like infrared does. And you want that penetration of the infrared to warm up the animal. And yeah, and we know, I mean, even in, in the human side of the world, we have all these, you know, saunas coming out, near infrared saunas, and we understand the healing properties that it gives to us. So we, we certainly want to be providing it to the animals as well. And as far as heat sources that we can use artificially, do you have sort of recommendations on what people should go towards? Do you know what? Tungsten mm. is, is almost perfect. I'll, I'll go back to the, um, where is it? I'll go back to the share screen. See, you can see the this this curve here yep exactly i can see that okay this is the penetration curve of infrared c into the dermis okay so it penetrates most deeply at these wavelengths which is about 800 900 nanometers you see my little pointer there yeah yeah so that peak is about 800 nanometers so around there is where the biggest penetration is and this graph on the right here is showing you the same thing but a different way yeah. so you can see that the, the yellow light penetrates this far but the red light gets right in amongst the where the blood is and where the vessels are and so it's, the heat starts being not only absorbed but it starts being circulated around the body wow that's okay? a great now, that's a great chart that is that's awesome okay now if we go to this baby here this is a curve for a halogen lamp and it's 2600 C which is I don't know 2600 degrees K don't forget you add some 230 73 to that to be K so yeah. this is um, 2000 3000 K lamp say and you can see it's got a big fat peak here now that coincides with the peak we just seen yeah and if you look at the carbon heat projectors, you, you know, the ones from Arcadia and others. Yeah, yeah. Their, their curve, because they're carbon, looks like this. And it provides some of that infrared A, but it, most of its energy is infrared B, which is here. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Now, if you go to this curve, what I've done is taken that purple curve you just saw and flipped it upside down and superimposed it on the one you've just seen. Mm. Got it. Actually... I was talking about Fran Baines. When I when I <laughs> when I came across this, I sent the graphs. Look, Fran, look what I found. Look how these stack up. This is the perfect match. It's the solution we were looking for. And I sent them to her. And what the, the woman had done is she <laughs> taken those two and flipped them to do this. And in fact, this is 
this is the curve that she sent back to me after I sent you those two curves. And she, she sent me this. And wow. we're both excited because look, look how well that matches. Yeah, so you so, basically have the penetration of the infrared, the, the graph matching with what the tungsten yeah, bulb yeah, produces. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Absolutely excellent. And you can see that where there's some benef benefit from the, uh, um, the carbon in the heat projector because it kind of matches this one. Right. But it's nowhere near as effective. Nowhere near. And it's, this is just a beautiful answer to the question that you've just asked me. Yeah, that is, and then you can imagine if you just use a heat map, for example, it's nowhere on this chart, and it's you're no, no. missing those peaks completely. Okay, back to you and me. That made sense. Yeah, no, that that's great. So I think this. I'm not sure if this is a, a silly question. It might be have to do with that. This is not possible. But theoretically, is it, would it be possible to produce or to have a energy source that only produces? infrared a without carrying some visible light i'm not even sure why you would want to do that but i'm just more curious um, is or we don't we I, don't have I'm a metal not, that we can burn uh, in, infrared a is is as a result of um something getting flipping hot and radiating <laughs> yeah at those wavelengths and it's just black body radiation and you 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 could you can make a filament to be more pointy, in, in, you know, a higher Q on, yeah. on, on the curve. You understand Q because you did radios. Yeah, or, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's got, a, if you like, a higher Q, but you've still got the, the bits on the side. Now, what you can do is you could probably put a glass which, with a filter characteristic, right, you right, know, a right. bandpass filter that cuts off the visible side and cuts off the other infrared side. But... Why would you do that? Exactly, yeah. It, it was more of like a theoretical question. I mean, technically, you could have that tight band. It would make no sense for reptile care because they, they get no. the use of the visible and as well. So what, what, what you do is you have a lamp that produces lots and lots of visible light, bright mm -hmm. light, and then you have um, the tungsten to produce the infrared. And together, they work really well. And I think it's really important to, to note the decor in the cage is also really important because we, we talked about the infrared sea radiating off, radiating off the earth. And if you don't have decor in the enclosure that can absorb that heat and, and then give off the infrared sea. So what are some things people can do to, to have some, is heat capacity the right word, in, into their enclosure? Yeah, it's absolutely. The exact, like, funnily enough, I spent an hour and a half speaking to Joe this morning, Joe Brabin. <laughs> yeah. Because he's... he's He's working on a new video, and that, and that that I think tries to explain this really, really hard subject. Yes, I, 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 mean, I tried to ask I, him about it yesterday, and he's like, "I can't tell you anything. I need to talk to Roman first. <laughs> I, I, and he's, we are blessed in this hobby with some um, very bright young people yeah. just just coming up. Joe is one. Liam Sinclair is another one. Harvey Tweets is another one. And they all, they all bright, clever, talented people with way good presentation skills. I mean, old, old farts like me can't present and do this stuff. We, <laughs> we just understand little bits and pieces of it. And um, but but yourself and those bright people that are bringing up and sharing information, really, really good. Uh, anyway, I was speaking to Joe this morning about heat and heat mats exactly that matter um and he's going to go away and try something um but what i do is I, I glue a heat mat to a big lump of rock that i make myself and use that as a mass and i just turn it on at night just to keep stuff warm at 20 degrees or so but in the day i shine my basking lamps on it um and I let that warm up and I, I control the temperature it warms up to um, using dimmers on the lamps. So I, I shine bright light onto it, but also the heat is mostly produced by um, tungsten filament lamps. Yeah, no, and yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And I think rock is really the best way, the, the best, it's, the most efficient thing you can use. It's got a good capacity for heat. I mean, water is another good one. Right, but rocks, rocks. You can't bask on water very well. But you can <laughs> on rock. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that, so that, that's, that's great. And I know right now you're working on a pretty interesting experiment of some sort. So you have an eight-foot Viv and you're trying out different lighting in, yeah. in different areas. Yeah. Can you kind of walk us through what you're testing because sort of how you set it up? Okay, so there's, there's some of us that have got a different opinion on which lights are better, which aren't. Which I know there's people that won't be seen dead with a light that's six thousand K and some people won't be seen dead with LEDs and some people won't be seen dead showing, I don't know, halides. And and each is right and each is wrong. And so I thought, well, how do you test this? It's no good just putting one lamp on in a viv, turning it on and saying, Oh my my little lizard likes this, so therefore it's okay. Because you don't give them a choice. Yeah. So I thought was well, how do I do this? So I thought, well, you do an effing big viv, like <laughs> big, huge, yeah, uh, which is two and a half meters, um, and then you divide it into three, and you put three positions. I chose three because there were LEDs, MVBs, and metal halides. They're, they're the big three contenders for lights. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I thought, well, if I divide that into three, and have each position to be identical, which I've, I've done. And in each position, I have a basking spot, which is exactly the same. So I've got three slabs that are about, I don't know, 40 centimeters by, I don't know, 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters, all weigh exactly the same, all have a heat mat, all have temperature sensors in the same positions all have an air vent in the same place, all have a UVB lamp, all have a tungsten halogen lamp, and all have a visible light lamp. So that was a premise. And then, then we talked about, well, what's important, what, what parameters are important. And um, speaking with Fran and, and Gary, we thought, well, let's fix the temperature. Let's make the temperature on the, the, the thing that we fixed. And if you look at TB, which is, TB is the body temperature of, of an animal that it most preferred. And for many animals, it's around 40, 41, 42 degrees centigrade. So yeah, I'll, I'll make it that. So I started, I put the halogen lamps on dimmers, not, not thermostatically controlled dimmers, but manually controlled dimmers because then I can control the power and I can measure the power curve for the temperature. So I can put power at 10%, measure temperature at 20%. So I can plot the curve for each of the lamps. And now I can do that for not just the power and the heat, but also the lumens. You can measure the lumens because sure. lumens might be proportional to power. So I could do that for the lamps I've tested. So I can set the temperature of the lamp by tweaking each of the controllers. I can have the light, visible light in the background, and then set the power so that each of the places is at 40 degrees. I thought it'd be easy, wouldn't it? You know, you just set it up, they're all identical, put in lizards, and see what's, you know, I've got see a time that, so I do about a thousand shots in a day, and make it into a video, and then every 10 minutes count where the lizards are, plot a graph of where they are, but compare it with temperatures and you can tell from the three spots because it's on a video, you can see where they are, um, where the hell these animals are. Yeah. So, which is what I did. First cut, they hated the halides. <laughs> well, I couldn't explain it. There was me, Serena, um, Serena Wunderlich, another very, very good, bright person, German, She's the German go-to for the German Herb Society. Um, and she was saying, we Germans, we like these lamps. We use them everywhere. And here I was in this experiment, having the lizards preferring the MV, the mercury vapor lamps, preferring those to these fabulous halides. And I spent, I don't know, three months just mecking around with trying to understand it. And I, I must have tried four different halides, four different brands. All of them were not liked. Weird. Weird, I know. <laughs> and then 
And then I thought, well, what is it that they don't like? And then I flipped, I flipped it and I said, what is it that they like? Mm -hmm. Now, metal halides have got no infrared content. Yeah, the most invisible light. LEDs have got no visible light content. They're no infrared content. But mercury vapor has got infrared content because the start mechanism on a mercury lamp is, is actually a tungsten carbon filament. Mm. So if you look at the bottom of a mercury vapor lamp, you'll see a big fat uh, filament, I don't know what it is, 20, 30 watts equivalent right. of, a, of a tungsten lamp. And that's why they feel warm. The heat you get from a halide lamp or a, mer- or a LED lamp is not because of infrared, it's because of the strength of the visible light. You know, we talked about the magnifying glass earlier. Right, right. So those lights that produce only visible light actually produce heat. But that heat is due to visible heat and not infrared. Okay, I, okay. so that, that I didn't realize. So interesting. So you can still feel the heat from yeah. visible light as long as it's intensified, but it's not actually in the infrared spectrum at all. No, and it, it huh. still burns the surface of your skin. Right. But it's not warming you. <laughs> Do you get right. it? Yes, yeah, no, totally, yeah. Wow. Okay, so it's That's really important you get that. Yeah. So so this rock that you're measuring 40 degrees on, being lit by um, a halide lamp, it's 40 degrees, and you say, well, that's the temperature, therefore, the basking light. But it's not the temperature, you, you're looking at the quality of the ray. Right. And the quality of the ray from the halide it's very lovely visible light, but no infrared content. And they weren't like, and so when you look at where the power was on the tungsten halogen lamps, because there was so much energy heating the rock up from the halide, I had to turn down the tungsten halogen lamp to reach the 40 degrees. So there was no infrared hitting that rock. Huh. Okay. Interesting. So, so they were searching the IR. They were looking for the infrared. So they weren't hating the, in, the halogen. They were loving the infrared. And there wasn't any on that spot because I turned it right down. Right. Now the LED, which they, they did like, doesn't produce as much heat. First of all, it was a 20, 40 watt LED still producing masses of light. It's more efficient than the halide, um, but not, not so much heat. So the wick was turned up on the tungsten halogen lamp, and so <laughs> lizards were going out. The one they liked best, the one that everybody said was awful, was a mercury vapor lamp, because it's got its own infrared. And I was adding to it. Right. So there was bags of infrared. And so the boy said, ah, give me that mercury vapor because I like that stuff. To us human eyes, it's a horrible color. <laughs> but the right. lizard didn't care diddly squat. No. They wanted where the heat was. Interesting. And I tried that with a, um, um, a monitor. I, I had a skink, but that was always hidey. I never saw the bloody thing. So that didn't count. And yeah. then a bearded dragon. And then... Um, collared lizards and um, desert desert iguanas. So I've had a number of species, and they're all fairly consistent. Wow. So, yeah, the the, the mercury vapor vapor bulbs do have a very wide spectrum when it comes to the, the energy they produce, because they even go into the UVB as well. Yeah, they're a, they're they're a, they're a good lamp. It's just the human eye doesn't like them. Right. And it's not up to us. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing was, when I knew that what the problem was with halides, I then dropped down from in color temperature from uh, 4,600 to 3,800, uh, the um, Philips lamps, the 830s. But I also dropped down in watts so that the power from the lamp 
wasn't as great hitting the basking spot. And when I did that, and I needed to increase the infrared to warm up the spot, things changed. They come back. They come back. Right. Interesting. And, and then, and then I had to mess around because the the lizards like this spot better than that spot. And then, then they decided to breed, and they bred under that spot. And so, the choice of where you bask wasn't then any longer which was the best light. It was which was physically the best spot, or physically the most interesting. You know, and, and it was other factors started. Yes, there's lots of variables to control. And then summer came along, and the need to bask changed because of the higher ambient temperatures. And so the basking characteristics changed yet again. So when someone says, I've had this lizard and I've tried it with this lamp, until they tell me they've tried it with several lamps and they've given the lizard a choice, and they've tried it throughout the seasons, whether it's spring, whether it's breeding season, whether it's summer, and they've, they've laid the eggs and then are now building up for the next winter. Every one of those factors has changed the characteristics of basking. So and you do so really need to try everything and you, give them the choice. You've got to give them the choice. And then, and then there'll be things that, that there'll be questions asked which you don't know the answers to. Right. And I'm still trying to get my head around some of them. Yeah, it's, it seems bottomless. You know, it's like a bottomless endeavor. It's to really, understand. really hard. Um, yeah. And anybody that says this lamp is, is clear cut the best hasn't really thought about it. Yeah. There's um, like infinite layers to unpeel, and the, and the animals add the complexity to it that well, uh, it's just a never ending game, but it's fun. Remember, I was telling you about sensor fusion on the Apache where you've got different sensors. Right. And you, you put them together and you get a different answer. The same thing is true. We have no idea what the lizard can actually see. We have no idea. We can we can do strip, you know, charts of where the cones are and how much energy is produced by them, and what goes into the brain. But we don't know how the brain uses them. Exactly. We don't. We don't really know all that well in in humans. We think we do. Do you remember that gold and blue dress? Yes, yes. Yeah? And some people were saying it as black and white, and some people were saying, um, no, it's blue and, blue and white or gold and blue. Yeah. That yeah, was, and it, it was amazing. And, and people, the people whose, whose optic senses we understand and, and are experts in, because doctors know about it and ophthalmists know about them, and... Scientists can get those colors off the image and plot the colors directly. So you, you, you know what color they are. And yet there were these two groups of people seeing the same image with the same electro impulses from the same cones. They were visualizing two different things. Okay, so we, it took two years before we found out what caused that. So I so, forget what, what what do you know what the reason was that for that uh, yeah. optical illusion? What was that? It was psychological. Really, it was psychological. People that were used, people that were optimistic, tended to see one set of colors, and people that were more pessimistic could see another set of colors. It was psychological. Wow, that's so, insane. So the way we, I mean, color is is a perception that humans have i'm not sure that lizards do right color is just is you know yes. it just is and you might go oh it's warmer there i'll go and sit there and they might not analyze that it's oh it's the greener light they probably don't give a damn they just it's a warmer light yeah so i'm not having seen my lizards change where they sit because of temperature and not because of color. It doesn't fixate me which is the best lamp. Right. And and after, I don't know, hundreds of hours of testing, it's almost an equal 30-30 split between halides and LEDs and MVBs, depending on 
what part of the day is. You know, if it's they, they might come out and sit under the mercury vapors and bask first because it's got the most infrared, and then they might go and sit under the LED, and then they might go and sit under the um, um, halide. Incidentally, on the halides, where the ones are hated, the ones the Philips and I think is Osram, they didn't produce any UVB, they were just halide lamps, right. When I switch to, and I'll read this out to you because it's expert UV halide lamps, which produce a really good level of UV. It's a German company. Again, I got that from Serena. Thank you, Serena. Um, and I tested that, and that that just like day and night between the other lights. They really quite like that one as well. And so, it, um, is that one cause, because of the UV? You think it does have UV. And you think that's why they like they were drawn to it more? They, uh, but the mercury vapor has UVB as well. Right, 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 right. So they're there too. And depending on where you are in the day, they will choose a different lamp. Even though they've got the same temperatures in the basket spots, if you look at the profile of where the animals are in the curve, they – I mean, Gary noticed this. He said, look at the curve. And there were – Animals at one spot early in the morning, and then there was a reduction in basking generally, just like outside in the world. And then basking again, perhaps in a different different lamp, later in the afternoon. So it's kind of replicating what nature does, but they were losing different lamps at different times of day. No, that could be any also, it could be that the air temperature was different. Because right. in the summer, I'm putting fans now, because... Um, I thought, I thought, they're not basking because they're already warm. Um, but they still need the infrared to for the health stuff. Um, and maybe they needed the infrared while the eggs were incubated in the females. And now yeah. that that incubation is done and the eggs have been laid, they don't need to be doing that stuff. Mm. It's just, it is too complex for me to get my head around these yeah. things yeah. it's it's not possible to have a very simple theory it's just a load of stuff you've got to somehow manage yeah you just got to work through this giant pile of information and and really use the animals as your teacher just make the changes see where they go and kind of play with it from that perspective not talked about humidity yet <laughs> yeah ex and that's the other thing is is that that adds no. a whole other complexity <laughs> it's, it's a bloody nightmare <laughs> yeah so have I got anywhere? I think I'm understanding things better. Can I write it down? No, I'm not smart enough yet. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's really saying something because you throw tons of time and energy into this and it, it's not a simple, clear-cut answer. And, th and that's one of the, so the things that I poke at the reptile hobby about is that w everything is so simplified and that's okay to start, but it's not okay to continue to care in these very simplistic ways because we're kind of robbed. Like I think that chart you showed is so perfect of showing the infrared penetrating into yeah. the blood tissue. Like Without that, that's just not fair to not provide it. One thing I would say is... Um, there's been papers and notes written about infrared um, and how some infrared might be um, harmful, infrared A. Um, of those tests, no, but no, to my knowledge, nobody's really said what powers are we using and what wavelengths are we using. Um, and there's a paper recently I read that talks about the power of infrared that's required for this healing effect. It's the first one I've seen, and the powers they talked about is a lot, lot lower than I had anticipated. Because the sun gives you, I don't know what it is, 40-odd percent infrared, which is about 40, 440 watts per square metre-ish. And I've got a chart somewhere that talks about this. Um, so if you've got 400, 300... Hmm. Is it 44 watts for light and 300? It's probably 330, 360 for the thread per square meter. So right. you divide a square meter by 10,000 cent square centimeters and it'll give you watts per square centimeter. And it ain't much. But some of these lamps, if you focus them, actually produce a lot more. 
So you've you've got to find the right power level. And burning hot under the lamp isn't a good thing. So my my guidance to, to you guys is use thermometers and that stuff. But in the end, put your hand underneath it and feel it. And if it's gently warm, I don't mean burning hot, just gently warm. You can just feel it. It's probably about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because. I think there's a lot of people that use very overpowered bulbs for their scenario yeah, yeah, and then yeah. they regulate it through a thermostat so they're using like 20% of the power. It's like just drop the power of the bulb down. But here's that would be the a lot thing. Easier. Depending on where the thermostat is, and this is another big debate, and there was a, a thing posted the other day on Reptile Lighting where somebody had got their sensors like that out of the in the air. It's not just measuring the basket spot. So right. if you've got a draft you're not actually measuring the temperature of the basking spot. Your thing is being cooled by the air. So my recommendation, and, and, uh, and this is where we're working with, is to physically connect the sensor to the basking spot. If it's a rock, connect right. it. And what I do is I put a stick a tube and I put the sensor inside the tube. So, so you're, il you're illuminating and heating the whole tube. Right. Not the sensor. And that is then on the, on the, and it didn't get kicked over by the animals then. What what type of metal is the tube made of? Because that's something that I wanted to ask you about. Because I think that's a really Aluminium, interesting brass. idea. Aluminium, brass, or anything like that. Oh, okay. It doesn't really matter. Aluminium, sorry. Aluminium, yeah. That's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, aluminum tube, you would just insert the, the probe into that and then have the aluminum tube touching the basking spot or you know on the basking spot, the rock or whatever you're using. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, have you got time to another picture? Yeah, absolutely. I started writing this up, but then I ran out of energy. <laughs> They're the lamps. All these lamps I've tested. Oh, wow. And this, this spot lamp here is the one that uh, I ended up with. And this, this one here on the left is the expert UV lamp. Um, cool. This LED bar from um, Arcadia also um, is one of my favorites because it lots and lots of light, really efficient. So it, yeah, lots it's a of nice light, light. heat. Um, I like those a lot. Um, all of those basking tile. That's that's the tile there on the right. You can so see that's how a big little it is. homemade tile, right? That's something that you've made out of your own concrete. Yeah. Or... Now, if you look here on the left, yeah. What I've got is a stick-on um, heat mat, and I've stuck it onto um, a ceramic tile. Yeah? Yep. And then I've stuck on top of that with silicon uh, a metal grid to it just give looks the like um, fencing or like a piece yeah, like yeah, of yeah, fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or um, galvanized steel. It's just Mesh. does two things. It conducts the heat from the tile, from the mat, and it also um, gives somewhere for the, for the concrete to set. And then here on where my arrow is, is my tube. This is a brass tube. Yeah. Which I've, there's two, there's one there and another one there. So I've got a choice of two positions. And they stick out the front here. They, they go all the way to the end. And so when I do the gloop in this bucket and I put it in on top of the tile, so this one is filled, this one is about to be filled, and this one isn't. So the, the pipe here, the centre, the hole here for the tube is just there. So when I measure... The temperature of the tile i'm actually measuring the temperature of the tile right and then i just let it set for two days and it becomes rock hard so in the viv the wires plug into the back into the tube and i stand the tile on top of these two ceramic sources i cut holes in and i fill it full of soil so the animals can get in underneath it if they want very cool so it's basically a ceramic tile with a heat mat, and then the probe is actually sandwiched between the yeah, almost yeah, like a yeah. homemade concrete. Yeah, that's that's an amazing idea. And this is this is sand and PVA glue, waterproof PVA glue. And you just mix and it I up. And I just mix it up, that's and great. it goes rock hard. It's perfect. And of course, if you add a bit of dark paint, some cement coloring, um, you can make it a dark color to absorb the light. Very cool. So is this document something that, event uh, that eventually you're going to have out there? Yeah, and, yeah. Because this looks like a fantastic document. Yeah, oh, there you go. Um, here, 
I'm, I'm infrared picture of the of being illuminated by the same lamp and seeing how the different that's the adder skin and that's a scoot and that's a shell and just just measuring what temperatures um what temperatures i'm getting but measuring them with three different infrared or temperature sensors so there's a professional standard infrared sensor this is an infrared gun standard thermometer i've got a data logger which is a thermocouple and then the readings on the floor and right. they all gave you slightly different answers so I, I know when i'm taking my readings which ones are likely to be the most accurate so is the FLIR the kind of the most accurate or no that... if you look at that the, if you take the average of these two, it's about 22 degrees. And this is about a degree and a half higher. Right. Okay. So you just kind of calibrate it in your head that way. Uh, I calibrate it in my head. But also, um, you can calibrate it by um, adjusting the reflectance on the camera. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. So that that's a great idea. That's a, that's a really interesting way to use a heat map uh, and, and, it, and have it controlled and, uh, properly. What I do, what I do is... I've got a heater in there and I've got the temperature sensor on the front and the temperature controller is, where is it? Uh, bear with, bear with. So there we go. I use one of these here. Everybody's got them, I hope. Inkbird. Yeah. So I control the temperature of the tile with this. Dead easy. Yeah, very simple. Those are, is that just an on-off, just an on-off yeah. thermostat? Yeah, that's yeah. all you need. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is that's fantastic. So, as far, I know you're very active on Facebook, and you, you you're constantly asking or answering many different questions and whatnot. Is there just a common mistake that you see people making when it comes to to heating? Hmm. Or there's too many of them. Yeah, they're <laughs> just understanding. It just. Because it I'm, is such a complicated topic. I've been and, doing this stuff uh, as a, you know, professionally with physics and stuff all my life. So it, it kind of comes to me. Right. But someone that's a writer or a salesman, they've never done physics or maths. This is really, really hard for them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's misconceptions and confusing infrared and ultraviolet. It really, really hard, and it's I kind of part of my job. Really, our job is to try and make it easy, and it's it's so hard. And sometimes I I can't do it very well. I mean, these young guys, Joseph and Liam, whatever, they they're so much better at presenting complex ideas than I am. So, you know, they're like apprentices. That I'm they're, they're kind of lovely yes. to do, yeah. um, and they they're so much better at doing this than I am so much better um and so i think it's not a, a fault it's just if you don't have that background i wish i could tell jokes i wish i could play music i can't you know some people do stuff and some people can't mm -hmm. and i can do this stuff but i can't tell a joke yeah the love of me so yeah. that's uh, maybe where you put your temperature sensor Okay. If it's if you're if you've got this this thing on a wire, the 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 end the thing that's indicating is the temperature of the black thing. If you put it in a draft, even though it's above above your basking spot, you're not measuring the temperature of the basking spot. You're measuring the temperature of the air above it. And if you've got a draft, it'll be something else. Right. And if right. you put it on the side, if you put it on the side over here, and you're, you're measuring that. If you've got something in the way or something blocks or falls over, it's an accident because then it thinks, oh, I'm gotten cold. So I'll turn the volume up. Right. So, um, and, and as that's why your tube works perfect because it kind of protects it from any yeah. drafts and whatnot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the mass of the, the rock doesn't change temperature quickly because right. it's yeah. not a little tiny sensor, it's an effing big rock. Mm, and that, yes. if you've got a draft or you open the door or whatever, that won't affect the temperature for, for, for long. Exactly. Or very much. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes sense. That, that's probably, yeah, that's a huge lesson for people to learn is that proper probe placement. And, yeah. And, yeah. Another thing that's of interest, 
with flight control system safety and failure modes are really important. You know, how does it fail? If this bit of wire breaks, what's the effect of it breaking? Does it fail on or does it fail off? Or does it, does this, you know, and now these systems are getting, control systems in VIVs are getting so complicated with so many wires. I think people have put them on believing that they'll just work. Um, and not much work is being done to deal with the failure mode of the equipment. So yes. if you've got the sensor in the wrong place and you've got this heater, and if it's chosen to be too big, you know, and this thing fails, what happens to the heater? You know, and, and my recommendation is buy the heater, turn it full on and leave it full on for a couple of days. And if you're still standing and not burned down, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. But do monitor it. You know, look at the, how it fails because one day it'll be painful to discover that it's failed the wrong way. Yeah, that's a great point. Run through the scenario in your brain what happens when your probe fails. Or, oh, yeah. And do it all so, the you, so you understand what will happen. So it's one other thing I wanted to chat with you about, you kind of mentioned earlier, was just the ventilation. And, and that's kind of another area that the hobby is starting to transition to. And I know that with your eight foot Viv, you do have some computer vans working. So maybe you could just quickly talk about what you're doing with those fans. And we've already mentioned how ventilation can impact your probe sensor. So there's probably some nuance yeah. there to figure out how to use that. So the, what I concluded was that the temperature that I'm managing for the tungsten lamps is the temperature on the rocks because that reflects the quality of the infrared coming from the tungsten lamps. Mm. Yep. Yeah? I'm not yeah. interested in the temperature. I'm interested in the quality of infrared. And because the measurement of infrared is so expensive, I couldn't afford to do it. The instruments are hard. The only way I can assess it is by the secondary temperature on the rock. That's what I'm interested in. The consequences of that, if uh, if the Viv is an enclosed space, which it is, is the inefficiency of the lamp, because it's producing other heat apart from the basking, producing heat from the, from itself. And if you want a lot of light, you need a lot of lamps. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of heat in there. And that heat is not necessarily desirable. And it's masking the basking characteristics of the animal. It's confusing the animal and me because I'm thinking, oh, it's not basking anymore. Well, it's not basking because it's too flipping hot. So, so now we've got to control the temperature of the air separately. And also you want this profile of a cool end somewhere. Right. Okay, so I thought, well, how do I do that? Well, I've got I've got vents on the front to suck the air in, to let the air in. And I was using convection with two holes above to let it convect up um, above the lamps. But that, in the summer, wasn't it good enough. And I wanted more. So what I did was I, I took a bit of guttering, you know, like a, that shape. Ah, well, that's good. The green thing works. There you go. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Thing. Um, and... Um, put it across the vents and then on the top of the guttering I put in three fans one across each position and I got one of these electronic controllers um, and put it in there as well and dropped the sensor from that controller down about midway in the Viv and so that when the temperature got to 28 degrees fans kicked in and suck sucked the air in using the same holes but just actively sucked it out and right. that improved things a lot and fortunately it also blew the temperature control and i've just had a new one delivered today so i can replace it um oh the the actual the the controller blew because it was was the fan it, too, too much for it or too hot oh, oh i see got it yeah yeah it was it was thermal stress so there's a failure mode there if, if it's still been summer and the cooling fan fails, fails, you've got a chance of overheating your animals. Mm -hmm. And right. luckily it happened just as the weather got cooler. But that's a failure mode I never considered. 
Right. Yeah, because you kind of assume that it, it can manage it, and and you do yeah, ha- yeah, yeah. have some vents there, but so it, convection it was, could still happen. It was wicked hot in the shed. Right. So and, much so that you know I had to stop testing at one stage because there was just too much power inside the vivarium. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So I think, and that's the thing is, and we we kind of talked about humidity as well. Humidity and air temperature. When you're adding all these extra lights, that's where you start to struggle. And but it's it's worth it because you you if you're not using the infrared lamps, then you're not giving the animal what they deserve to have. So we just have to play with the ventilation and humidity until it works. Yeah. You see, the lights, our lights, are only what twenty or thirty percent efficient. Right. Yeah, so you put in a kilowatt, you're only getting about 200 watts of light or heat. Mm. The rest is just infrared C, that just useless heat that heats stuff up. It's not actually doing the job of providing light or infrared or UVB. Now the sun, for every square meter, provides about a kilowatt. Let's just call it a kilowatt. So in an eight foot, 2.4 meters by 0.6, you've got about meter and a half square of a vivarium right yeah give or take yeah so that would be a kilowatt and a half now if you put just sunlight so if you wanted the same amount of energy from sunlight in that vivarium you'd have to have a kilowatt and a half you'd be generating a kilowatt and a half now if we're 30 percent efficient to produce the same light and heat you actually got to put three kilowatts in that little box right yeah, yeah? and so we can we'll never ever get to that level no you can that, you that would roast everything <laughs> yeah and so i'm having to make do with um what would it be three lamps for visual light at about 40 watts three tungstens running at 30 30 and 40 is 70 that's 200 10 watts and then three 35 watt UVB lamps that's another 100 so I'm, I'm talking about three or four hundred watts so you got some room until you get to three kilowatts but it's, it's still a lot of heat <laughs> yeah and if exactly. it's not going anywhere it heats the box up so yeah. a fraction of what the sunlight provides right yeah no that's that's very interesting so I think this was a fantastic conversation. We've covered so many things. I think this will give people a lot to chew on because we haven't gone in this deep into it yet. And it, so that's great. Oh, for pe- heaven for pe- forbid. <laughs> <laughs> There's always more room to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. As, as far as, so for, for, just, for just kind of wrapping up here, for people that, are, if they are very confused over what to do, they, they have a new animal, let's say a bearded dragon, and, and they're just, they want to know what the best heat source, we, we kind of talked about it. So the halogen is, is going to be your best for providing infrared. And of oh, course, yeah. And then the UV and the, and the visible light. The UVB is a T5s, I would suggest. Yeah. Um, but then for visible light, you've got a choice of three. You've got halide, you've got LED, and you've got MVB. Mm-hmm. Right. And there will be people that swear on halides. There'll be people that swear on LEDs. And there'll be people that swear on MVBs. The LEDs produce less heat. And they're most efficient. Right. The MVBs produce additional UVB and a, a light by basking. Hey, guys, a lovely color light. Um, you pay your money, it takes your choice. Right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so there's many options, but of course, providing the, the UV and the, the infrared is, is yeah. key. And then, and then you can kind of play around with the visible light and, and see what your animal's like. And like we said, they, they, they gravitate towards the infrared. So the more we can provide infrared A, the better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Roman, thank you so much. This is great. I know that you are active on, uh, on reptile lighting as well as uh, advancing herpetological husbandry on Facebook. Yeah. So if people do have questions. I'm sure if you, if they make Ask a comment there. in there. Yeah. And, then, and there's, there are other people that, I've got way more knowledge than I have that can answer questions better than I can. Awesome. So if they do have questions, they can pop them on there and they, they can see yeah, your stuff on yeah, there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Would you send me a link to this after you've done? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think this will be All right. Close. That is the end of that episode. Roman, thank you so much for joining me on the show. This is going to be a great resource for people. And as I said at the beginning, I think this is going to be one of those episodes that many of us are going to want to re-listen to several times to try to fully absorb this information. If you are someone who feels totally bewildered by heating and light, 
don't worry. It's a very bewildering subject. Even Roman, who spent hundreds of hours and has this really well-defined, good foundation in engineering, still is just saying, I'm just scratching the surface and there's so much more to uncover here. I highly recommend going to the show notes at animalsathomenetwork.com. Just click on Animals at Home header and then you'll see this episode, the episode tile, episode number 63. In the show notes, I have a bunch of really interesting things. Roman sent me a few great PDFs, particularly one that shows how different lighting sources or different heat sources that we use in the hobby produce different spectrum of infrared. So it has a bunch of little pie charts, which are just a great visual. If you're, Especially if you're someone who's visual, you're going to appreciate that chart. And of course, I added links to Tell Hicks' website, which is the artist that we talked about on the earlier part of the episode. And really unbelievable, fantastic work. It's really one of a kind as well. So definitely go check that out. I added the link to the book Life in a Shell by Donald Jackson, as well as the clip of the YouTube clip that Roman was discussing from John Campbell or Dr. John Campbell, who was discussing vitamin D and the coronavirus. So all of that is there for you as well. So before we wrap up, I want to just say one more thing about lighting and heating in general, especially if you're somebody that is kind of still confused by it. I want to define why you might be confused by it and hopefully alleviate some of that stress if you're just like looking at all this information and just can't understand it. So Immanuel Kant, who is a philosopher in the 18th century, now I'm, this is not going to be a quote, it's just something that I read a long time ago and I can't find a direct source for it, so I'm just going to sort of paraphrase it as best as possible. But he essentially made the claim that you cannot extract information about sense data from the structures that allow you to perceive the sense data. Now, that may have made things even a little bit more confusing, but what it means is we use our eyes to perceive light. We aren't able to use our eyes to understand light on a deeper level. The only thing that we get from our eyes is that sense data, is the way we perceive it. There's no way to get to that next level of depth of understanding. And I think that might be why when Roman was talking about the helicopter sensory data, when they take two separate things and they combine them, the sum of information when you combine them is is greater than the two sets of, maybe it's infrared and visual, for example. And when you combine those two types of sense data, you get a greater or more in-depth than you would have if you're just looking at each one individually. And I think that might be because you're actually stepping outside the ability to sense it. Anyway, I don't want to get too far down that road, but there's a really simple analogy that can use to to kind of simplify this even more. So I'm sure you've heard it before. There's these three fish or two, two young fish swimming in the ocean and an older fish comes by and gives them a nod and says, hey boys, how's the water? And the young, the two young fish are very confused and they swim off and then they look at each other and say, well, what's water? And it's because they are completely engulfed and enveloped in water all their life. They have no understanding or no perception of it because it's always there. And the way we perceive light and heat is the same way. When As soon as you open your eyes when you're first born, you're perceiving light. And it's almost impossible for us to get outside of that. You have to remember that animals all perceive light in different ways. Or many of us, many animals perceive light and the energy from the sun in completely different ways. And we're sort of stuck with having to analyze it through the homo sapien way. And that that's all we have. And that's why we want to... That, so again, I don't want to ramble on forever, but this is why it is confusing because we're looking at it through a single lens when it is so much more complicated than that, especially when you're talking about animals who perceive it in a very, very different way than we do. So if you are confused by it, don't worry. We're all confused by it. We're slowly advancing towards understanding it better and especially understanding it better when it comes to our husbandry of our reptiles. So anyway, that is the end of that episode. Again, Roman, thank you very much. If you are looking for more, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode. If you are interested in checking out their website, head to the affiliate links that are in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. And if you do end up making a purchase, a small commission does come back to me. I will catch you guys in the next episode.